You're listening to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast, where we discuss whatever the fuck we want to. And yes, we can put sex and drugs and Jesus all in the same bed and still be all right at the end of the day. My name is Devannon, and I'll be interviewing guests from every corner of this world as we dig into topics that are too risque for the morning show as we strive to help you understand what's really going on in your life. There is nothing off the table, and we've got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into this episode. This is the second episode I'm doing in a three-part series with the great Reverend Dr. Marshall Ledford, who runs a magnificent, phenomenal website called politicaltheologymatters.com. In this series, we are tackling those clobber passages from the Hebrew Bible, which conservative church people like to misinterpret and then use to condemn us and make themselves feel better. Marsha is super passionate about the rights of the alphabet community, and she's also super, very well educated and well versed in matters of the Bible. And, you know, that helps a hell of a lot. And so the title of today's blog is Leviticus Lacks an Understanding of Loving LGBT relationships. I really hope this sets someone free. Marsha, it's so great to have you back on the show today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great today. And thank you, Devannon. It's lovely to be back with you. Lovely as always. Uh, same here. And so uh, today we are going to be tackling another one of your beautiful blogs from your amazing blog page that's on your website. Um, we're going to be talking about Leviticus and the title of the blog is Leviticus lacks an understanding of loving LGBT relationships. And it's a super important passage to uh, talk about because so many churches and so many people who are supposed to be preachers use these scriptures in order to try to manipulate and otherwise intimidate people. Uh, but before we get into that juiciness, tell us a little bit about your website and your history. Sure. Uh, for the first 30 years of my working life, I've been a civil rights attorney. And uh, I sensed a call to ordained ministry as a teenager, but I wasn't seeing uh, women at the pulpit and the altar when I was coming of age in the late 70s and early 80s. So I decided to go into law and I became a civil rights attorney because i it's a way to help people. Uh, but I became increasingly frustrated because you can't or argue the gospel in court necessarily and hope to be successful. And in my late 40s, it seemed like the Holy Spirit was not going to let this go and kept poking me. So uh, I decided to go to seminary and get into the ordination process. And uh, then after I was ordained, I worked in the Latino community in Southwest Detroit, and I was appalled at uh, what I saw our government, our laws doing to families, tearing them apart. And so I decided to study political theology and uh, got a doctor of ministry. And since then, I started Political Theology Matters, and that's what I'm working on full-time to equip the faithful uh, to engage in faith-based advocacy for greater social justice. Yay, we can all use a lot more uh, social justice, especially in this political climate that we're in right now. You know, when I was in school, I remember reading where like church and state was supposed to be separated and, and all of that. And so it seems like church and state are like arm in arm these days. Uh, we've got, you know, churches endorsing political people and, and it's, it's just a hot mess from what it's become. So yeah. I think your website is absolutely quintessential as crucial as necessary and it helps to break down a lot of confusion and I'm excited to see the direction that it's headed in. And, and that is uh, political theology matters.com, which will be in the show notes. Well, thank you. Absolutely. My sugar. 
<laughs> and let's see. Um, so today in particular, we're going to be focusing on Leviticus chapter 18 and 22 and Leviticus 20 and verse 13. I'm going to read these two scriptures. And then we're going to get into like a history first before we really dive into them. And I'll explain how we're going to matriculate, go through this. So Leviticus 18 and 22 says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20 and 13 says, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And so you talk about in the blog, the difference between looking at a verse in a standalone fashion versus looking at the verses that precede them and come after them in order to avoid what, what, what you're talking about is a, a pretext. A pretext is kind of like a preconceived notion or something that you're infusing into it, or as you say, a foregone conclusion. And um, you define it more precisely, a pretext, uh, you said it can involve uh, concealing an intent to mislead understanding or interpretation. A form of pretext concerns offering an interpretation while concealing a preconceived motive or agenda, such as condemning, condemning all homosexual relationships across time. And so, and so what we're going to be doing today is looking at looking at these scriptures and adding some context to them and kind of showing people ways that they can go through the Bible and figure out uh, the true truth on their own and really take a look at it. And so what we're saying here is that the people who have explained these passages over time didn't do a thorough enough job and a lot of their own prejudices and hate were infused into the translations that were given. And so you can go ahead and, and speak to us, please, Marsha, about context, pretext, and why it's important to really take the whole picture when we're looking at scripture. Okay, so thank you for that, Devanna, because that really sets the stage for us. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Jesse Jackson has a quote that I love that is a text without a context is a pretext. Mm -hmm. And so if you go in to look at scripture, if any of us do, uh, and say we just narrow, narrow in or laser in on one or two verses with the idea that when we want to prove something that's already in our minds, we are operating with a pretext. And that has been how these Leviticus passages have been read for a long time. And keep in mind that uh, patriarchy is very much at work here, and um, the idea that a man would be penetrated like a woman would be penetrated uh, was anathema to their understanding of gender roles and, uh, you know, played into how the female, the woman, uh, is subordinate, not only in the culture, but um, in terms of concepts like this. So one of the reasons that this was uh, prohibited was to maintain the patriarchal order. Um, another reason was uh, the Canaanites were engaging in temple cultic prostitution and one of the most important reasons that we have Leviticus is so that the Israelites could conduct themselves in ways that were very distinctive from any other of the surrounding nations. It was a way for them to set themselves apart. And so engaging in temple prostitution at all was uh, prohibited uh, and uh, either gender. So we have that to consider. And there would have been, even though the Israelites, through God's intervention, 
defeated the Canaanites to take over their land, they were still there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they would have, you know, um, um, had social contact with the Canaanites. And in fact, they needed the Canaanites to help them learn how to grow crops because uh, the Israelites had wandered the desert. They were nomads. They relied, they ate off of their herds and the manna. They, uh, you know, ate milk and cheese and um, uh, they weren't in the habit of growing things. So there was, there's going to be social interaction and uh, that's how they would have learned some of these cultic practices and um, other kinds of behavior that uh, the writers of Leviticus had codified that went against what God wanted them to do. Israel was a tiny nation. It was surrounded. Uh, They had to have sons. They had to build an army. It was constantly on their mind. And one of the things that we see in Leviticus is the blessings of land and children are tied very carefully to uh, doing what the Holy Code said, the Purity Code. And if you engaged in conduct that did not result in legitimate children, uh, you got spit out of the land. You were, you know, the, the language is literally, you become vomited from the land. And that's part of why it's important to read the verses around a particular text to find out what's going before and after. We call this a canonical reading. You know, sometimes you can read the whole chapter before and after a verse. Sometimes you would read the whole uh, book. Uh, But that canonical reading is very, very important to help us set the proper context so that we really understand what's going on. So um, if you engaged in conduct that would result in an illegitimate child or no children at all, uh, that was a violation of God's law. And so that's another reason why um, uh, male-to-male sex would have been prohibited because it's a spilling of seed. And the spilling of seed or semen, semen was considered a finite quantity. It was, uh, it had a, um, you know, it had a very holy uh, aspect to it. And so wasting it so that you're not creating children by it was considered very sinful. All of these factors weigh in to these passages that typically have been used to just clobber LGBT people right over the head. So let's look uh, at what Leviticus uh, sets forth for people. It it, um, regulates a lot of different kinds of conduct. And I'll give you some quick examples and then we'll get to the ones we're really gonna deal with in this discussion but the manner in which animals were sacrificed for thanksgiving or atonement, there's specific rules about that. The means of atonement for individual and for communal sin. And that's important because uh, these prohibitions against male-to-male sex would have uh, addressed communal sin. In other words, not bearing children. That would be a communal sin. Uh, cure the care of curable skin diseases, the annual cycle of daily Sabbath and festival rituals. All of this is covered in Leviticus. It's a very comprehensive holiness code, uh, regulating the purification of women after menses and childbirth, regulating the purification of men after seminal emission, regulating the purification of anyone coming in contact with a corpse. Now we get into the four that we're dealing with. Prohibiting sexual relations with close kin, prohibiting child sacrifice, which we believe was uh, practiced by the Canaanites to the god Molech, prohibiting a man having sex with another man, and prohibiting anyone having sex with an animal. 
So, um, you know, this isn't an exhaustive list, but you get the idea. Um, and particularly we're focusing on passages that deal with fertility, killing children or progeny, or wasting semen with other men and animals. And if you want to get a much longer list, you can go to Leviticus, especially if you need some sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can go to Levit Leviticus 18 and check it out for yourself. It's very interesting to me how so many of the things on this list, like, say, the um, regulating the pur purification of men after seminal emission. So that basically meant after a man had a wet dream, he couldn't, he had to go and like purify himself in a way like if a woman uh, was having her period, you know, she couldn't like be around other people and stuff like that. And now, mm -hmm. you know, in this day and time, you know, if I have a wet dream, it's totally cool. I can just like take a shower and go out and, you know, meddle with people. A woman can be on her period and just handle that and just still go out in society. Right. You know, so, so much of this, you know, we don't even fool with, you know, anymore at all. Nobody even right. to the second thought of bat an eye or a wink, you know, if these sort is this, this, this sort of thing, it's like people pick and choose what they still want to clobber people with and what it was just gonna like be okay. Yeah. But, you know, but strictly speaking, if somebody's going to reach back to Leviticus and be like, well, it says men are not supposed to be doing this, well, then that means, you know, every month, you know, women should just disappear and go into hiding, <laughs> you know, when they have their uh, periods. And for God's sakes, every time a man ejaculates in his sleep at night, you know, that we got to go into hiding too. You, you see, that would be too inconvenient for most people. Mm -hmm. You know, your conservatives and evangelicals and everybody included aren't going to want to sequester themselves on a damn near continual basis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's easy to go in here and throw shade at the things that people don't like. But if yeah. you're going to enforce one part of something so strictly, then you really should enforce the whole thing or nothing at all. Right. You know? And so I just wanted to highlight the hypocrisy <laughs> yeah. of it, you know of it all because where they're pulling this from they don't ever talk about all of these other rules and stuff like that um regarding menstruation and a thousand other things like you said the list is long it goes for chapters and chapters and chapters in the book of leviticus it's like a whole book of the law you know which is what they call it but people only you know conservative people only want to take a few pieces of it and like i said in our first interview you know, the majority of us are not Israelites anyway, you know, and, and this stuff is very unique to them and to their culture. In the book of Acts, you know, we were reprieved and um, we were relinquished of the responsibility to follow the Levitical code and not a, not a few pieces of it, <laughs> you know, you know, we are not of the bloodline of Abraham. And so none of this applies to us. You know, if you choose to follow the way of Jesus, but if you want to be bound by this, you can, but we were released from all of this. Right. And so. That's right. Uh, and, you know, we refer to this as a selectivity when you, uh, you know, rely on some portions, but not others. And that has, that's been a critique of uh, theologians who are in support of L the LGBTQ communities by saying that, you know, look, if you're going to eat shellfish, uh, then you've got to recognize that this is also a part of the, the purity code. And, um, you know, they're all on equal footing. None is considered more uh, egregious than another. At least it doesn't state that. And so you're being hypocritical when you enforce parts of it but not others like you said what you like you keep and what you don't like you get rid of as is convenient for yourself so uh that's that's a serious problem uh when we have people who uh are christians and uh eat clo uh or wear clothes of mixed textiles and eat right. shrimp and uh all of those things, but then take these specific passages and start 
uh, demeaning, humiliating, uh, creating a superior position for themselves by attacking LGBT people. Uh, and that's, that's why I thought it was so important to write about this. Because a lot of times people don't spend, you know, any study on what the words at the time meant, what the context is. And uh, it's very dangerous when you start emotionally and spiritually harming people with specific passages of the Bible in an attacking mode. Uh, people take their lives over stuff like this. And we have to stop that. They do. We rebuke suicide. We're not having it in this. And this is the way that we're rebuking it, not just in word, but indeed, but through education. Correct. And because growing up, you know, people hand those Bibles, they tell us to believe what's in it. And we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not until, but they, but God, nobody ever told me to fact check context research and be sure of, they just said this it. And, you know, and that, that was, that was the wrong advice to, to give me and for them to give us. And they really did us all with this service, but we now have so much information at our fingertips and we don't have to wait for a preacher to tell us, you know, what's in the Bible or what's said exactly and everything like that. And now you mentioned something I hadn't thought of before, but how the, the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, they were roaming through the wilderness. So they did not have time to, they, they, they didn't sit still long enough to grow a garden because they were all ready to move. And yeah, the older people who were in Egypt were there long enough to grow stuff. But by the time they made it to Canaan, they had all, God had killed all them all off because they mm -hmm. pissed them off. And, um, so the children that were born in the wilderness never knew anything about gardening. And that's near and dear to my heart because I, I, I keep a crop in the backyard. I just pulled some Kushaw squash off of there. I say in some cucumbers as well. And so, uh, I love the garden. Yeah. And, um. And, um, yeah, just like, uh, that was, uh, that was Abel. I think it was Abel was the, uh, gardener of uh, right. Cain and Abel that was back in the book of Genesis. Right. And so, and so, so y'all, when she talks about holiness, what she means, holiness is the same thing as like, say, sanctified in the new Testament, which is to be set apart. So to be holy. Does it mean to be walking around with like a halo glowing off of you or anything like that? It means that like the world is doing this or like in the case of the Israelites, every nation around you is going to sacrifice their children or mm. have temple prostitution mm. and worship other gods and stuff like that. But y'all are not going to do that. You're going to be different because I'm the Lord, your God, Yahweh, whatever you want to call me. And they have different gods. So. Holiness is the term used to define people who care about the Lord and want to follow him versus those mm -hmm. who don't. Mm -hmm. And so when, so, so when we're talking about holiness or the holiness code, this is what this is. Now it's a very strict code, but they live in a strict time. You know, things mm -hmm. were a lot of rougher. People were walking everywhere. They didn't have Alexis yep. and Mercedes Benz to drive us around. We didn't Correct. have, you know, the internet and stuff like that. And so they- It was hot. It was very, very hot. And then you could turn around and be very, very cold. You know, right. that's how those, the arid climates are. And so the Lord was dealing with a rough people during a rough time, you know, specific to them at that time. But, you know, here in the year 2021, like, like I said earlier, people are not going to stay home because they're menstruating. They're not interested in being restricted. They're not going to put a mask on. They're not going to do anything. <laughs> you know, that they don't fucking want to do, let alone everything that's written in the book of Leviticus. But we can focus just on the gay people. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> right. But the Lord, but Jesus warned people against hypocrisy. Oh, yes. In, in his ministry, he didn't say anything about the gays, but he said a hell of a lot about hypocrisy. Yes. And that indeed. really, 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 really got on Jesus' nerve. And um, so conservative people have been warned against their hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is it pride to go hand in hand and it's blinding. And that's why people cannot read through the Bible and find themselves in it, although they can find other people in it. Because when they read through it, they're not looking for themselves. You know, they're reading it to see what's wrong with everyone else in the world. <laughs> as opposed right. 
as opposed to what's wrong with them. I believe Jesus said something like, quit worrying about the log in somebody else, or the splinter in somebody else's eye, and look at the log in your own. Yeah, depending on which version you read. Yeah, but I mean, the point there is, you know, quit worrying, get up, getting up in other people's business and just worry about your own. Yeah, and another party calls them busybodies meddling in other men's affairs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, like uh, one of the examples I give in the blog is if you read a text uh, and it says that A killed B and you have no other information, none, you can't really draw a conclusion. You don't know if A killed B in self-defense or in the defense of a third party um, and was you know, indicating he was going to use fatal force, B was against A. You don't know this. You can't, you can't make, uh, you can't learn, you can't draw conclusions when the information on its face doesn't give it to you. You know, when the text on its face doesn't give you the information that you need. And so that's part of what we do when we consider the historical context of a, of a verse or set of verses. Because unless you know the history of the Canaanites, um, your ability to really appreciate what this is saying becomes compromised. And that's exactly uh, what has happened in interpreting these two passages over time. Um, and I would like to uh, uh, add in a couple of verses, if it's okay with you, that I'm talking about in terms of what's happening before, what's happening around the text. It's okay. time to read. It's time to time to read some more. And this is what you know plays into why these prohibitions were happening, because they're supposed to be making babies. Uh, the fun part. Uh, th th I just have to say before you get started to all my gay children out there, as as Mother Rue. As Mother Rue uh, Paul would tell us, baby, reading is fundamental. Quite. So, <laughs> and I love her. <laughs> All right. Now, do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all of these nations I am casting out before you defile themselves. In other words, I cast out the Canaanites because they were doing this stuff to make room for you. So the, the Canaanites were vomited out of their land. Okay. The land became defiled so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my ordinances and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, for all of these abominations the men of the land did who were before you so that the land became defiled. Lest the land vomit you out when you defile it as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For whoever shall do any of these abominations that person shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs which were practiced before you and never to defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord, your God. Okay. And what happened? Israel got vomited out because it did not stay true to worshiping Yahweh. And it defiled the land and they got taken away to Babylon. Right? Right. Okay. So, um, and this language, mind you, is you shall. So it's mandatory. This is not some suggestion that God is making. This is what you are going to do. If you're going to have this land and be blessed with, you know, milk and honey, then this is what you're going to do. Um. So Canaan has been vomited out to make room for the Israelites. 
uh, in the uh, passage in chapter 18, it references Moloch, the god that the Canaanites apparently were conducting child sacrifice. Um, there's no male-to-male -male conduct or having sex with animals. This all goes back to being, um, you know, creating progeny for the power of Israel. Uh, so it's not quite as simple as just, uh, you know, there's no gay sex. Because at the time, they didn't even understand what that would mean, like we do now. This was just about copying the Canaanites in some of their sexual practices. You look like you want to say something. Well, well I'm listening to you and I'm just thinking and chewing on the information and processing. Um, you're right, because um, yeah, well, a lot of it was about procreation and stuff like that. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of the, um, the, there's a, there's an instance that happened when like a man was having sex with a woman and he did not want to come inside of her. And so God killed him. Odin. 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 O-N-A-N. -E yeah. Yeah. Um, and I thought that that was a beautiful, well, if, if I could, would use such, could use such a word to describe that, but it, it beautifully relates to what we're talking about because the, so what happened, Odin went in to have sex with this wow oh, that's what it was it was leveret marriage he had to marry his yeah. his brother's wife because he died and leveret marriage means that uh the brother who conceives a child with the widow that child belongs to the brother right he did not yeah. want to honor his brother I, right they clearly had a misunderstanding of in life right. something like that and it, yeah. it, so the man was treacherous and instead of telling the woman he didn't want to fool with her in any way, he wanted to use her for her body and have the sex, but not re raise the child, not have the child. Mm. And so the Lord saw that in the Bible, it does say that his semen spilled on the ground. Right. Now they use this scripture in the Pentecostal church to tell us not to masturbate. Uh, they, okay. And they were like, so you see the sem semen got spilled on the ground. So therefore when you masturbate, it goes on the ground, which it doesn't necessarily have to, honey. There's all kinds of things you can do with that baby gravy. And, yeah. um, and you, so, and that was an example of them taking it out of context and using it to manipulate us because they felt like masturbation was the devil. But it's also um, a great way to illustrate how serious God was about the raising of children. You know, if a man has sex with a woman and he, and he comes inside of a condom, it still didn't go inside of her anyway. So, so that's a, 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 a foolish thing in terms of, hey, you shouldn't masturbate because of this one scripture. Um, but I wanted to... Did, did they also teach that using a condom was um, sinful? Not in the Pentecostal church. They don't uh, think that's far with it. Okay. <laughs> they pick and choose. Yep. <laughs> but strictly, strictly speaking, by, if you're going to go by the Levitical code, then yeah, contraceptives are totally uh, not of God. Right. Period blank. He's not interested in contraceptives. He wants, if you've got to have sex, then have children. Otherwise, what's the point? According to this Levitical code. Correct. But straight people are not, I'm not straight people. Conservative people are not interested in hearing that because they don't, they want to, you know, you know, get their tubes tied and get vasectomies and whatever they can so they can have as much sex as they possibly can without having to be bothered with too many children. Mm -hmm. and, and this is totally acceptable in, in conservative circles that I don't have an opinion about it one way or the other because I'm going to adopt one day and it's not my business what the fuck two other people want to do. They can find themselves in the Bible. But for those who um who have a problem with so many things that people want to do, honey, you, you've you already been written about. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, heard a story of a, a fellow who had a bird that he named Onan because he would spill his seed onto the bottom. <laughs> so I thought I'd just throw that in there. So a little biblical humor there. Um, anyway. I'll never look at the birds that feed on my bird feeder in the backyard the same when the seed right. fall out of there hitting, hitting the ground. So let's, uh, I, said something about gay sex and then you know the word homosexuality uh 
that's a relatively modern term coined in, I think, 1869. Um, it's not a term that's been around very long, certainly not nearly as long as when these passages were written. Uh, the concept of sexual orientation that we have today would not have been something that made sense to folks back then. And so let's talk about uh, anachronism. When you take a term um, and you put it, you use it in a context that would be inappropriate. So to use the term homosexual with the understanding that we have of what that is today and sexual orientation, to, to uh, it, translate, to interpret Leviticus, using these terms would be to engage in using an anachronism. In other words, something that doesn't belong there because the context is wrong. The context is completely off. So one of the examples I used in the, in the other blog that we talked about with Paul was if you were watching Ben-Hur, which is a movie that it has Jesus in it, uh, Ben-Hur is played by Charlton Heston, and he's a charioteer, and he is in races in the Colosseum. And if so, if there was a car, you know, a 2021 Corvette in this race, uh, that would be an anachronism. And likewise, a chariot in a, a modern day Grand Prix would be an anachronism. So we had to be very, very careful about uh, either blatantly or surreptitiously, secretly trying to uh, build meaning into a text that is out of time with it. And that's another thing that has gone on very much so because we are now post-enlightenment. We have the social sciences. We study human sexuality. We study uh, all sorts of things about being human. And we know so much more about um, sexuality and, and sexual health and all of it. In 1973, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health or Mental Health removed the word homosexuality as a disorder. 1973, it was the DSM-3, which was the current one at the time. We're now up to five. So uh, modern psychiatry and psychology does not view homosexuality as a mental disorder. And yet we still see uh, the refusal to incorporate our modern context of the social sciences and our understanding about human sexuality, and we're still trying to cram them into the Bible. A document that was written 20, 1800, the New Testament, what, about 1900 years ago, and the Old Testament much longer. So this is a problem because what it does is it, it gives a false justification to those who are trying to demean and criticize and exclude LGBT people um, by uh, reading current phraseology into super old texts. And it is, uh, the consequences can be fatal doing stuff like this. Right. And um, speaking of mental health, I just want to say, globally speaking, there's like a lot of mental health problems. And, you know, mm -hmm. some are diagnosed, some are diagnosable, and then some are not so apparent. And so these people, conservative people, otherwise generally hateful folks who are using these scriptures to try to dominate and manipulate other people in their head, they yep. may not necessarily think that they are doing that. It depends on their level of awareness. Um, cause like when, when I was, when I was getting my hypnotherapy certification, I learned a great, quite a great deal about like the subconscious, which is like, I think it was 88% of the brain and 12% was conscious. And then, which means that your inner working belief system and values, things that you don't even think about are running on autopilot and that's driving the majority of what you do from one day to the next. You know, unless you reach, you know, higher levels of consciousness and enlightenment. 
And so some of these people sitting up here in these churches telling everybody what all they're going to go to hell for and, you know, you got to get out, you can't stay here, may not even be consciously aware that they're operating from a, a space of what we're talking about here using an, 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 an anachronistic approach, prejudice and hateful, they may not even much think of that, yeah. you know? And so this is why we cannot trust other people. You know, everything that just falls out of somebody's mouth, you know, we got to go and look at it for ourselves because, you know, we don't really know what's truly motivating people and they don't either. Right. Um, it, it reminds me of, you know, how does a fish know it's in water? We are all, especially if we're raised in the church, I'm going to talk about this. Um, we are taught a theology as we are growing up. Our parents, our grandparents, our elders, um, our teachers and pastors, all of that teach us our theology. Um, there are some couple of professors, Stone and Duke, who've written a wonderful book called How to Think Theologically, and I'll give this to you in the show notes to Bannon. Um, talk about how we don't even realize that this theological paradigm is being embedded in us. It just becomes a part of us, like a fish in water. Uh -huh. And a fish can't live out of water. So then if we come up against something that challenges this paradigm, it, it could create a psychic and spiritual crisis in us because it challenges the way, the entire way that we have nav navigated the world and our life experience. And it can be very, very disorienting. This happened to me when I was, you know, I was a church kid. I think I've mentioned that in the previous episode. I was all over church. Uh, and then when I started to figure out what was going on and coming out to myself, I had a terrible blow up with God about, you know, why did you make me this way? And why, what's happening? And, you know, I don't want to have to choose. And I know that I can't change and blah, blah, blah. Um, I went through a paradigm shift. I had to figure out a way to navigate having my relationship with God and uh, being my true self, created in the image of God. I am a daughter of God. That flew in the face of what I was taught growing up. And so uh, this deconstruction is becoming the word that people are using. Ex-evangelicals are going through what is called a deconstruction of their faith because they too get challenged by these various paradigms they were taught about, you know, being anti-gay and being sexist and, uh, you know, pay, uh, following the patriarchy and the purity code and all the stuff that people are challenging now. Uh, it's because we are challenging that embedded theology that we were initially raised with. And just because we were taught it by our elders doesn't mean it's necessarily good theology. Very often it isn't. This is a problem. This is a big, big problem. The people who are de deconstructing don't just walk away. They want to take it apart and figure it out because they want to hold on to their faith. Um, and so I highly recommend that people who are interested in learning more about uh, dealing with our embedded theological paradigm uh, should take a look at this book. It's an easy, skinny little read. Um, and I, I think it's... Uh, I read it in seminary, but I think lay people uh, will benefit greatly from uh, reading this book to help them with their deconstruction. Yeah, you can send me all of that information. I'll put it Abs in the uh, show notes. Uh, did Absolutely. You say, did you say earlier, ex-evangelical? Yes. What is an ex-evangelical? Well, this is a movement now of people who have become fed up with the archaic teachings of the evangelical movement. Again, they focus on patriarchy, sexism, purity culture, being anti-LGBT, um, you know, anti-women's ordination, anti-everything you can think of. Uh, and people are, and, and people have been, there's a lot of folks out there who 
deal with a lot of spiritual, emotional, and sometimes physical abuse through their pastors, their church leaders, who with a congregational model and no, um, you know, higher authority, uh, have a lot of leeway in terms of what they do to their congregants. Um, and this is how we, you know, hear about these stories of various kinds of abuse. So, and I belong to a Facebook group, by the way, of people who have uh, left their spirit, you know, they're abusing congregation and they're trying to navigate the world uh, and, you know, reset their paradigm and figure out how to hold on to their faith, but get away from the, the caustic nature, the toxic nature of an abusive pastoral relationship. Uh, so there's a whole movement out there of people who no longer consider themselves evangelicals. Uh, so they're calling themselves ex-evangelicals. And I noticed for a lot of the women, it's because they're trying to get away from this horrible purity culture stuff. So you see people, it's okay to be pulled out of the matrix. Like when you're, uh, uh, as, you're as you're describing that, I'm just seeing it. Keanu Reeves as Neo in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Actually waking up from the bullshit. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's important for people to know that it, that it, that you would not be the only one to break ranks with whatever it is that you have no thought, thought you believed in. And what Marsha is saying is not that, you know, it takes a lot of bravery and boldness and courage to, to be like, all right, I believe this for this many years. Wow. I've never really thought about why I believe this. Okay, so let me begin to dissect this because uh, I'm no longer going to take it at face value. As I dissect it, I'm not finding that I'm liking what I'm seeing, so I'm going to find a way to still follow the Lord, but do so without being hateful towards other people. Exactly. And um, and it reminds me of when I I went to when I left, you know, like the Pentecostal churches, and you know, got more into more non-denominationalism and stuff like that. I would find people who would say something like they're recovering Baptist, you know, or, or they're mm -hmm. recovering uh, Methodist, or in my case, a recovering Pentecostal. You yeah. know, because you have been abused, uh, you know, by those denominations and stuff like that, and it's mind fucked you. And so now you've got to get yourself in a situation where you can heal. Mm -hmm. you know, over time and stuff like that. And so I'm very happy to hear, I've never heard the term ex evangelical. I think that it is, I think it's, I think it's real humble of an individual when they're willing to take a second look at something yes, and, and understand that they can do that without mm -hmm. abandoning God or compromising their beliefs. They're just simply saying that they're human and they could have gotten anything wrong. Exactly. There's, um, what happens uh, very often too, when somebody uh, ch starts challenging and asking, quest asking questions, uh, they encounter a lot of resistance within the church structure because they don't want questions and they don't want anybody questioning their authority. And then sometimes uh, an individual will walk away and then the pastor will uh, instruct the remaining congregants to have no contact with this person. So even though you may have good friendships and, you know, whatnot, uh, the pastor teaches the congregation to shun this person for daring to leave and challenge, you know, whatever it is that has been going on, which is another indication that there's been some pretty serious spiritual or psychological abuse, if nothing else. Um, and so a lot of times when people are, say they're evangelicals, they've lost their church community. They've been booted out, and that indeed does, like you said, take that takes tremendous courage. And then you're being disparaged, you know, by the pastor to the congregation. He's a backslider, you know. She's, um, you know, she's a slut. She doesn't want to, you know, go by the purity code. Blah blah blah. So there's all this stuff that goes on in addition. Uh, this tremendous amount of loss for people that are deconstructing like this. And it's a, it's a very scary place. But I would say to people who maybe are considering, you know, uh, is this church structure working for me? Um, it's a, this is a St. Um, John of the Cross called this the dark night of the soul. This can be a 
pretty dark night of the soul going through this, but I believe that anytime you tr you are being true to God and asking questions out of a place of uh, humility and wanting to grow closer to God, that you'll come out on the other side. It, it's going to be okay. But I'm I also think that it's important uh, to to build a new community. Don't try to do this, you know, by yourself. Find others. And you can do that on Facebook and other social media. There's lots of people who are going through this, like you said. Right. And um, yeah, a community is a real, it's really the whole, I don't know, that's at least half of the reason why we even bother to go to churches anyway. Yeah. Like, in, but you know, during the time when I went to churches, I didn't look at it like that. But there's so much community because, you know, we're not designed to be alone and we're going to seek out community in some type of way. And when I got kicked out of church, you know, as you were saying that, I was reminded of the fact that nobody ever did call me. You know, right. I had worked alongside for two, three years, nights, you know, several days and nights a week. You know, suddenly I disappeared and nobody called me at all. And so I don't know, maybe they told them I was a heretic, you know, and, and whatever the case may be, which I don't know. I think that would be kind of cool if I was labeled as a heretic. That's a cool name. <laughs> and um, I, I would lay money that they were told not to be in touch with you. I'd, I'd put a bet on that. And so, and then when you were talking about Dark Knight of the Soul, I was, I was going to mention that earlier because what you were describing when you were questioning, your, it sounded like your sexuality or who you were before the Lord. To me, that sounded like your Dark Knight of the Soul. Mm -hmm. No as question. You, as you were going through it. And I went through something like that too when I was at a Pentecostal church in Riverside, California. You know, this church was telling us, you know, of course not to masturbate because that was having sex with demons, you know, and this, and this, 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 this church here was some sort of church that would like tell people to speak in tongues, you know, lay hands on them. And then that's how they would get the Holy ghost, you know, or receive the Holy spirit as people say, um, you know, so they had a lot of uh, liberties, I shall say, uh, as they read through the Bible, it's just, there was just shit that they would just feel like they could do. And they expected us to just believe it because they said so. Mm -hmm. um, during this time, I dated girls. I had sex with women to see if I could make myself not be gay, bisexual, uh -huh. or whatever. Uh, I no longer care to refer to myself by any title. I don't want to, I don't want to be gay, bisexual, whatever. I just, I just, I just, I, I am that I am, <laughs> you know, and so I am that I am. And so, but, but I did, I was like, I've argued or, you know, I went to, I didn't argue with the Lord, but I struggled with it. I was like, okay, why am I this way? Please take this from me. You know, yeah. I hated myself mm -hmm. and it was because of what other people said and not because of a conclusion I drew, not mm -hmm. because of bad experiences that I had in the process of being who I am. It was strictly 100% because of the words that came out of other people's mouths. Yes. And then, um, but I wasn't thinking like that at the time. I was impressionable. I trusted that these people knew more than me because they were on stage and had pedigrees and titles, which I know all now know, I now know none of that matters. And, um, and I, and it, you know, you know, a girl, you know, a girl got hurt in the process, you know, cause I couldn't continue the relationship. You know, I wasn't straight, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but better to date somebody for a few months than, than to marry them for 20 years and have children and then be like, Hey, yeah, I'm not, I'm still not straight. <laughs> you know, so, which yep. does, which does happen. Yeah. So out of pressure, out of nothing but pre peer pressure. I I'd like to just throw a couple of things out there. Um, don't be afraid of biblical scholarship, people. Uh, there, there is a, a an undercurrent that if you go to seminary and you, you know, study the Bible outside of the text itself, that you will lose your faith or that, you know, it's going to corrupt your belief or any of that. And I have found that to be the complete opposite. The more information that I have from scholars who devote their lives to better understanding the Bible and the history behind it, the, the deeper my faith gets. 
And I, I think that there's a fear that if you try to really crack the scriptures open, that it will ruin it for you. And I don't think that's the case. Read one of these uh, blo blogs on the clobber passages and see if you feel like my cracking them open for context and history has made them less accessible or less approachable because I think it's the opposite. And that was my experience in seminary. And the other thing to remember is the entire Bible is devoted to the liberation of God's people. The Old Testament and the New Testament. And time after time, God gets pretty provoked with the Israelites and is, you know, ready to really kick their butts. And somebody talks God out of it. Because the ultimate message of the Bible is liberation, love, inclusion, support, community, all of those things. That's what the Bible is about. And when people are teaching you to use the Bible to hate people, there is something wrong going on. Well, I feel like that pretty much sums up <laughs> what the whole conversation was about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, hang in there, pray, listen to what God is saying to you. And don't let, too often, now you can't see me, but I'm pointing up. Uh, too often, we let, just what you said, you're, you had bad experiences because of what people said to you. And too often, we let these horizontal relationships with other people dictate what our relation is, relationship is with our creator. And nobody should be com coming between us and our creator. That relationship is special. We are created in the image of our maker. And so stop letting others dictate to you what your relationship with God should be like. Amen on a Tuesday morning. There isn't anything, <laughs> else, that, there isn't anything else that I, I'm going to say to you much try to follow that. So, go. So this was our second conversation and we're going to have a third <laughs> interview to to close out this series and to tie it all in and then we're going to be talking about old Sodom and Gomorrah and <laughs> and, and, and we're going to really get clobbery with it then and uh and 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 and, and, and a little and a little bit salty pun intended <laughs> relating to <laughs> Lot's wife <laughs> quite <laughs> 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 yeah, and we're going to include Gibeah too, Josh, Judges 19. That's a nasty passage. Yep, we're going to talk about it all. And so, mm -hmm. and so, um, and so again, uh, I'll list in the show notes your social media, your website, uh, you know, and everything like that. And, um, and then we'll be considering continuing the conversation next time. And so we will, we won't really consider the matter fully closed till then like they like they used to do in the uh or, or do in the southern churches when they have a revival so if it's like a five-day revival mm -hmm. they don't they don't actually do the benediction or the closing prayer mm -hmm. until the fifth night right. <laughs> so, so we won't do that we won't actually close this until the end of the next conversation <laughs> all right that sounds great well blessings on you today in whatever you're going to be up to after we're done it's just been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on, on this show. Thank you all so much for taking time to listen to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. It really means everything to me. Look, if you love the show, you can find more information and resources at sexdrugsandjesus.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Feel free to reach out to me directly at Devannon at sexdrugsandjesus.com and on Twitter and Facebook as well. My name is Devannon and it's been wonderful being your host today. And just remember that everything is going to be all right. <laughs>